Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Gary Sibbel. This is Wound Healing SOS, Seeking Optimal Success, Gecko to the Rescue. I will be acting as the moderator tonight. And on the next slide are my conflicts of interest. Can I have the next slide, please? These conflicts largely are the Ministry of Health, uh, Province of Ontario, and the Mississauga Hawk. Halton Lynn. Um, I'm also uh, the coordinator for the IIWCC and Echo Ontario Skin and Wound. Next slide. I am the project lead for these two programs as well as the IIWCC. We'd like to welcome our three speakers tonight. Dr. Robin Evans is the medical director of the Wound Healing Clinic at Women's College Hospital. Uh, Robin's also a family doctor and very involved in Wounds Canada. Kathy Burroughs is a former president of Wounds Canada and is a contract clinical consultant with Profuse MedTech Incorporated. Rochelle Duong is the manager of clinical programs, wound care. You'll notice the new heading, Ontario Health, Central Region, Mississauga Halton, with no conflicts to declare all patient photos were obtained with permission. Let's look at our objectives. Following this session, the participants will examine the etiology and pathophysiology of edema on wound healing, identify impediments to wound healing that lead to chronic wounds, recognize the impact of early interventions on wound healing using a validated risk assessment tool, and assess the role of gecko device as a first-line adjunctive therapy in the treatment and management of wounds. Okay, our first talk, why and how edema influences wound healing. Welcome, Dr. Robin Evans. Thank you very much, Dr. Sybil, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight and for, for Gecko for inviting me to speak on the very basic principles of edema and why wounds don't heal. In a nutshell, I'll move on to more, more interesting aspects of how the Gecko can help us. Next slide. So what is edema? This is an important concept to understand. Uh, so edema is fluid that exists in the interstitial space. So this is a space where you're not supposed to have fluid. It's supposed to go back into vessels. And it occurs in other areas of the body where, where we're getting fluid in un, unwanted places, and they're listed here. Um, and it's largely all the same mechanism of action. We're principally interested in the legs, which we define as peripheral edema. Next. So just to get you started and hope everyone's warmed up here, which of the following about edema is false? Uh, edema causes, uh, is caused by lymphatic, uh, arterial, and venous issues. Recurrent cellulitis is common. Prescribing um, furosemide is an effective um, way of managing venous insufficiency. And edema can be a sign of DVT or deep vein thrombosis. So I hope everyone's uh, committing to an answer here. And uh, looking at this, 24% of people uh, pick number one. Uh, most people, 61, pick prescribing furosemide is effective. And, and, and that is the correct answer to this question. The first, uh, that the other two, three answers um, will be looked at more in depth as we go through the, the conversation about edema. And you also understand why furosemide, once we understand the pathophysiology, is not an effective form of treatment. One of the big things here, though, recurrent cellulitis is common, infection is common, and that's one of the issues we have with edema. Next slide. Okay, so edema, why do we care about it? Well, largely our patients don't like it. And I can tell you as a family physician, uh, I'll get calls very quickly to my office if someone's got swelling in an extremity. It's poorly tolerated. Um, and when you get gross edema, like we see in this picture, there's huge quality of life issues in terms of pain and mobility issues. But in the skin itself, we have these stasis changes, which cause an itchiness, breaking of the skin. Uh, sometimes patients don't like the cosmetic appearance of the hyperpigmentation and the woody fibrosis. And ultimately, uh, cellulitis is a big risk 
Ulcerations obviously um, are the thing we're most interested in, in in preventing and infection. So there's many reasons why we need to get rid of edema and we need to do it quicker than we're doing. So this is, takes us back to Starling's law in how fluid moves. We really need to understand this to understand the concept of what's happening. Starling's law um, has been around for a long time, whether we do or don't like talking about it. Uh, blood from the arterial end in the capillary bread uh, is pulled into the tissues by hydrostatic pressure and then pulled back at the other end after it's done its job in the interstitial fluid by proteins, which are known as oncotic pressure. This law was revised in 2010, and there's been quite a lot written about the role of the lymphatic system, which is intertwined with that whole capillary bed and actually is moving a lot of the fluids back up the system into the uh, circulation again. So we can't forget or underplay the role of the lymphatic system as well as the, as the uh, venous capillary system. So I like to look at edema as this. This is quite a simple analogy. And I think if everyone looks at edema and they see a patient, is this a localized problem or is it a systemic problem? So obviously the systemic problem is that sink that's overflowing. And that would be similar to a patient who has edema in many different compartments versus uh, a pipe that's blocked underneath the sink, which we could say would be analogous to a leg that was had too much fluid in the interstitial space. So we, can't, we have to think about this and we have to uh, do more than just uh, stop the, the flow of fluid. We actually have to think about what's causing this. It's not enough to put all these super absorbents and costly dressings on. And we know that doesn't work for plumbing. It also doesn't work for lower legs. So um, understanding what the cause of the edema is very important. Next. So if you think of it as these three main causes, volume overload, meaning overwhelming the system, like you saw with the sink, like congestive heart failure is probably one of our com most common reasons, but renal disease, low protein states. So if you don't have that oncotic pressure to pull the fluid back into the venous system, the fluid will stay there and put pressure in that system. So renal disease, malnutrition, uh, liver disease, or GI losing enteropathies will all cause these low protein state states. Uh, one of the ones we can't forget and is very common to our patients is damage to capillaries or lymphatic system. And this is in way of happening with trauma, surgery, or loss of the lymphatic system like we see with breast cancer surgery, uh, removing the lymphatic system at the arm. Uh, you see huge lymphatic um, issues in that arm. But even if we think of surgery, even uh, surgery related to hip or knee surgery can damage the lymphatic system and the venous return. So we're dealing with a lot of issues here with our patients and largely as patients age, they'll have more than one of these issues as a cause for the uh, peripheral edema. Next. At the bedside, it's easier to look at it this way. So we have either have acute onset edema, chronic, or is it one-sided or bilateral, both sides. Um, I think easy to look at unilateral acute, one of the things we have to exclude here is a DVT. Uh, obviously, morbidity and mortality is, is a big issue for DVT. We mustn't miss this. Cellulitis as well, sprains. And when it's unilateral, either, either it's acute or chronic, you have to think of a pelvic mass. If it's bilateral um, and acute, also DVT comes into play and, and cancers can cause that. Uh, we do think more of medication and heart failure and nephrotic syndrome. Chronic is largely what we see most of, and so this is an easier list to remember. So unilateral would be venous disease or lymphatic system issues, and then bilateral venous heart failure lymphedema. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but rather uh, a pigeonhole for you to sort of understand the primary reasons for this, but there can also be others related to this. So another question to keep you all alive, uh, venous insufficiency results from all of the following except so uh, is it a result of obstruction as in a DVT, failure of the calf muscle pump, valvular incompetence, chronic lymphedema, or smoking? Alrighty, so uh, most people thought it was smoking, um, and I hope the other answers are going to become a lot more clear as we go to the next side. And really, smoking is gets off uh, scot-free on this one, and there's very few other things it does, but it's not a principal cause of venous insufficiency. Um, and the other ones are much better answers. So go to the next slide. So if we look at venous return, um, this is a cartoon that looks at the valvular issues in the, in, uh, 
in the lower extremity. So uh, the, the picture on the left, you see that blood is flowing up through the venous system, the valves open, and uh, as, you, um, as, as time goes on, the valves close, and the, the fluid does not back flow, so everything's moving in a forward trajectory. Unfortunately, when you have valvular problems, whoops, when you have valvular problems, the venous uh, system distends and those valves are no longer close enough to close and fluid can go either way, up or down, more or less, one way or the other, and you get fluid that will get locked in that interstitial space. Um, this is what happens when you get varicose veins. Next slide. Putting this all together, valvular insufficiency occurs as a result of a number of different things. When you think of valvular insufficiency, um, there are many reasons and sort of anything that causes downward pressure in the system. So uh, patients who are, are overweight, multiple pregnancies, there's been a lot of pressure in that system. People with jobs such as chefs, barbers, doctors, surgeons, nurses, anyone on their feet all day long, you're not activating any system to move the fluid up and it stays in the venous system, distending the vein, causing problems with the valves and that causes the valvular insufficiency. Obstruction is largely a result of DVT and that's uh, quite easy to elicit from the history. Failure of the calf muscle pump is something we should spend some time on. This is a very important system returning uh, blood flow through the venous system as well as the lymphatic system. Uh, so anything that affects the heel toe gait will affect the blood flowing back up to the heart. And this can be a result of so many things. It will be individual to your patients. But if we think of things that affect the, the hip, the knee, in terms of, of uh, arthritis or, or um, joint replacements, uh, sprains or strains, arthritis at the ankle. Um, there's so many reasons it can be individual to a patient. Using um, uh, walkers, rollators, tends to have a shuffling gait for these patients, as does Parkinson's disease. And it's also valuable to even look at the patient's shoe wear um, because a good tied shoe will um, allow you to walk with a better heel-toe gait than uh, slippers or um, flip-flops or un un unenclosed shoes. Next slide. As a source of, uh, just to be complete about this edema issue, arterial edema does exist as well, and we should be aware of this. Um, when you get large vessels being blocked up, you get dilatation of the capillaries, and you can get this uh, dependent rubor picture where that, that uh, left foot on that patient looks very uh, red compared to the other side. And you must think of uh, arterial edema as a cause, not necessarily cellulitis. At the bedside, if you were to lift that leg up, the color would diminish and then it would come back. And if, of course, if you had a cellulitis, that cellulitis would stay uh, independent of the position of that leg. Next slide. So we're gonna move on to wound healing now. Um, we understand all the basis of edema, which can keep coming back, but we wanna know why and what is happening with, with these slow to heal wounds. I think we thank Dr. Sybil a lot for this healable maintenance and non-healable um, uh, pigeonholing of, of, of ulcers. So the healable wound, if you identify the cause, should heal. Maintenance wounds uh, are not healing largely as a result of system factors or adherence factors. And non-healable wounds are not healing because you cannot correct the cause, such as occurs with malignancy or arterial insufficiency. But, but what, a lot of what we do is these non-healing or slow healing wounds. And the literature supports about 30% of venous leg ulcers not healing within 24 weeks. This is a long time. Uh, this is half a year. Uh, and there is no holy grail. We wish there was. And every, every uh, leg ulcer or diabetic foot ulcer uh, can fall into this non-healing or slow healing trajectory. Again, okay, so which is the least likely to influence wound perfusion? Wound perfusion is really important, and I'm not talking about wound perfusion in the big arteries. It's more the small vessels that are, are getting close to your wound that, are, that need to be there to provide uh, appropriate nutrients and healing uh, for that wound. So which is least likely to influence perfusion? Smoking, edema, infection, lipodermatous sclerosis, woody fibrosis, or any kind of scarring, or vitamin D deficiency. Um, so go ahead and uh, commit. So when I was making this slide up, as you're just putting these uh, numbers in, I really had a hard time finding uh, 
something that didn't affect perfusion. It seems to me most things do. It's really an issue uh, in the lower extremity. So if we can post those answers. All right, excellent. Everyone got this one. So there are a large number of reasons for perfusion issues. Vitamin D is not, not one of them. Next slide. Okay, so um, this is a wound you would typically see in, in your travels in clinics or in hospitals or in any care setting. This patient's had this wound for a very long time. It's been over a course of six to eight months. Uh, there's a lot of chronic issues in here, and this is typically what we see. And it's kind of like a vicious cycle we have going on. We have the issue of inflammation and infection, uh, local superficial infection. But this concept of biofilm is occurring and apparently occurs in 70% of chronic wounds. This is all underpinned by uh, patient comorbidities and perfusion is a problem. So it's really a vicious cycle and what can we do about it? So the wound bed prep really is our, our um, holy grail of how we manage these wounds. And we're really wanting to move this to uh, move it forward in a better, faster trajectory. So we need to start thinking of ways of doing this in terms of adjuvant therapies. What edema and infection have to do with these wounds, and we need to be very cognizant of this, is that um, we know that management of edema reduces the risk of recurrent infections or cellulitis. And there was a New, New England Journal of Medicine article published very recently looking at just this and looking at the use of compression, reducing edema and reducing cellulitis, and in fact is a big factor. We know that this edema, um, we get stasis changes and breakage of the skin. We also get breakage between the toes and, and fungus gets in there causing uh, tinea pedis, and this is largely a result of the toes being close together, which is, is even worse with swelling. Um, so these are two major causes. And then we have the edema fluid itself, which takes away some bactericidal properties of the skin. And just the, the true fact of having edema, we get poor perfusion locally, and the edema provides a great medium for, for bacterial growth. So edema is one of the factors we really need to be cognizant of to reduce for the patients. Next slide. Inflammatory effects at the wound bed uh, is being looked at very carefully now. And there was a really good article by uh, Michael Stacy. I think a lot of people recognize uh, in the wound care world. And he was looked at a lot of the biochemical markers in the wound base. And we know that there's a lot of inflammatory cytokines, um, the metametalloproteases and elastases, which are uh, largely in, in uh, too, abund too much abundance, which affects the growth factors and as well as these fibroblasts and epithelial cells undergo senescence very quickly and are not very useful um, to fix this wound or help it heal. So these are all important effects and we do have dressings that address this, uh, but by reducing the inflammatory and infectious component, uh, we can improve the uh, progression of this wound. Next slide. So largely what we're looking at here is patient factors uh, the, the, the effects of inflammation, infection, and edema. And remember, this is quite a vicious cycle and they all feed on one another. Uh, but ultimately what's happening with all of these things is we're really getting uh, problems with local perfusion or blood flow uh, locally to these wounds. And we need to do a better job at managing these issues. So we look at what, what the patients are, are going through and pain is a big factor here. Pain is, pain is a result of many things, but it's been um, known to be a result of distension due to the edema, so reducing edema will help. Managing the infection and inflammation more quickly will also diminish pain. And if we don't get progression to this lipodermatosclerosis, we can help patients. Mobility is a problem. Long-term wearing of compression wraps, multiple layers, does affect the ankle movement. And we have to remember this and maybe have to think about physiotherapy, but it is a concern. Fitting of shoe wear can be a problem for mobility. And again, uh, patients who have pain don't move very much. So that again is a vicious cycle. Socially, uh, wound-related issues due to frequency of dressing changes, exudate, uh, just the, the swollen leg is unsightly. And of course, pain is not uh, a very good enticing um, thing for social interactions. Employment, the list is endless. Um, pain is a problem and patients don't get back to their employment. So there, this, is, this is on many levels, we need to be better at this for our patients. Next 
So adjuvant therapy. Um, so if we want to move along their trajectory, when we know have, we have a difficult to heal wound, this is something we should think about. And it doesn't replace primary therapy. Primary therapy, wound bed prep is, exists, but it is something we can add to this and do it in a more quick manner to improve the rate of healing. I'm going to move this on to Kathy now to talk more about the gecko and how it can address issues such as edema and local perfusion to improve many of the things that I've described in this talk. Thanks Just for Just before Kathy starts, remember that you can ask questions and put them in the uh, question and answers for the end. So any questions that you've got, thanks Robin and Kathy, you're on. Thank you, Dr. Sibbalt. Next slide, please. So the indications for the gecko wound therapy device, uh, it's Health Canada registered uh, for increased blood circulation, perfusion blood flow, the promotion of wound healing, treatment of edema, and treatment of ischemia and venous insufficiency. And this is just a little clip of the mechanism of action. It just takes a few minutes. You can see here where the device is being placed over the common perineal nerve. It gently stimulates uh, the nerve, creating a, a twitch and activation of the calf muscle pump and increases the blood circulation equivalent to about 60% of walking. So the gecko wound therapy device stimulates the common perineal nerve on a low frequency uh, at one uh, hertz per second. And this is the, an exciting piece uh, for me um, because we now have what we call the W3 device, which is the next generation. And so it, instead of our previous device was six hours for six days a week, we're now getting double the treatment um, with the newer one. It's 12 hours per day and seven days a week and each device lasts two days. It also comes with three electrodes as opposed to two, which provides more comfort and ease of fitting. Uh, it still has 10 stimulation levels to accommodate the anatomy variances. Also, it's wristwatch size, only weighs 10 grams, and it's battery operated, self-contained, and self-retentive. So here's your first question for me. How does the gecko device increase peripheral arterial blood flow? The gecko device actually uh, activates the foot and calf muscle pumps. So it, uh, it actually improves the circulatory uh, blood flow. Um, the incorrect answer is it decreases arterial velocity. And in fact, it actually increases the velocity. So we'll just go to the next slide. And the next slide as well. And this is a study that a paper that was uh, that was done by uh, Das and all. And this is a, a 2020 paper. And they looked at improving blood flow in the lower limb. So what they found was that it increased uh, the peak velocity from 57 to 78 centimeters in the sitting position. And in the recumbent position or lying position, it was 79 to 98. Uh, centimeters per second. And the peak uh, venous velocity in the sitting position went from 10 to 33 centimeters per second. And in the recumbent position was 14 to 47 centimeters. So the conclusion of the study was that the activation of the venous muscle pumps and improvement of arterial flow assisted oxygen delivery at the wound site. The gecko device they felt was a worthwhile intervention to insist in the healing of venous leg ulcers by providing a mechanistic explanation for the increased healing rates previously reported. And this is a speckle spectroscopy of an infected wound. And speckle spectroscopy is an optical method for measuring blood flow in the tissues. And you can see here on the left that this is baseline. And once the gecko device has been turned on and activated, it increased the microcirculatory flux uh, by 225% in the wound bed. And in the peri-wound skin, it was increased by 67%. And it reached a, quite a, a statistical significance with this. Next slide, please. And this is uh, 
another uh, one that was done by Boston Quip, Dr. Harding as well. Um, and it looked at the immediately increases microcirculatory blood flow to the wound bed and edge in patients with ischemic lower limbs. Um, and you can see on the left that that wound bed is uh, uh, quite chronic and it's got a lot of uh, not so great tissue in it. Um, the middle B is before the device was turned on. And then in C, the device was activated and there's quite a significant increase to the wound bed and the peri wound area. So the results from this study um, show that there was immediate increase in microcirculatory blood flow to the wound and wound edges. The mean flux increased from 306 to 652 units and the pulsati pulsatility increased from 27 to 219. And these numbers, let me um, just say that at the end of the presentation, the Q&A, that is one of the questions that will be addressed, the difference uh, in velocity and flux. So the increased wound bed flux was 64%, quite a significant uh, statistical analysis, or they reached statistical analysis. Peri wound area flux was 37%, and the pulsatility in the limb was 188%. And this is a, this was a significant study that was done here in Canada. It was done at London Health Sciences Centre in uh, Ontario, and they did a randomized control study of 221 patients, uh, patients who were post kidney transplantation. And they did uh, look at a lot of different metrics, but one of the ones for, uh, related to blood flow was that there was a higher femoral vein velocity at 18.9 centimeters per second versus uh, standard of care, which was intermittent pneumatic compression and TED stockings. But what's, what really stands out besides the uh, increase in femoral velocity was the fact that they saw significant uh, leg edema reduction um, they also saw weight gain uh, was less in the gecko group and urinary output was far more significant in the uh, gecko group. And I guess this speaks to the fact that with gecko, we know that it's not just moving the fluid uh, above and below sort of like a compression bandage. We know it's systemic. And in my experience with uh, a patient uh, in long-term care, they had started the patient on gecko and the average daily output for that patient was about 600 uh, to 800 meals a day. And immediately within the first 24 hours, the urinary output increased. And by day six, which was the end of a week's treatment, the patient was uh, up to 3,500 uh, meals of urine. And length of stay decreased in uh, this patient, in, uh, sorry, in the study. Uh, by one day. They also saw a decrease in complex wound infections, um, almost half, or it was more than half, um, had uh, less infections. And so the hospital uh, observation, the cost savings per patient with the gecko device was about $2,300 per day. So this is from Wounds Canada, the best practice recommendations for venous-like ulcers, um, calf muscle pump activator, the stimulation of the common perineal nerve in the lower leg using low frequency nerve stimulation or something like gecko, may be a comfortable and practical method to support healing of venous ulcers. And I'm going to pass it on to Rochelle now. Thanks, Kathy, and good evening, everybody. Um, I will now continue on the rest of, of the presentation and we'll be discussing uh, Mississauga Halt and Lynn's um, perspective and, and experience with uh, the Gecko device in everyday practice. So we did a case series of 11 patients with venous leg ulcers using Gecko uh, within home and community care. Next slide, slide please. So this is my question. 
Um, have you used the Gecko device within your practice? No, so quite a few of you have not. So hopefully the information that you are hearing today will be very useful and might uh, may influence whether you consider using Gecko. Next slide. So um, initially, I'll give you a bit of background. Um, Mississauga Halton did evaluate the Gecko device in 2016, um, and it was successful in that initial evaluation. Shortly after, um, we added the Gecko device onto the formulary, and, and then post addition to formulary, we wanted to have a look to see how often and or how frequent gecko was being um, utilized within practice. Um, our current protocol, or at the time the protocol, was to provide gecko therapy for the treatment of venous like ulcers and diabetic foot ulcers. Um, those that did not reduce in size by 30% at 30 days of best practice should be considered uh, to be, uh, should be considered um, with the use of, of gecko. Uh, so after nine months, our, um, we decided to do a, an audit and we noticed that gecko wasn't being applied as per our protocols and our policy. And there was a delay of the application of gecko. Um, and it was actually considered between 90 and 100 days. So we wanted to understand where this delay was coming from and what we could do to influence um, the use of gecko sooner rather than later. Next slide. So we sought to do a quality improvement initiative and we wanted to understand whether gecko could be considered as the first line of therapy um, and also understand why clinicians were waiting and where that the that delay was coming from in the application of Gecko. So we sought to use a validated tool. Um, and this tool, which you'll see it in the next few slides, um, was the Venus Leg Ulcer Risk Assessment Tool developed by Christina Parker. And we're looking at whether or not this validated tool would influence early intervention of Gecko to improve patients' outcomes and experience. As well, we also wanted to gain an understanding of the patient's perspective and the quality of life or the impact the wound would have on their quality of life. And from this quality improvement initiative, we wanted to see if there would be an opportunity to pot potentially revisit our policy and procedures based on what we learned from this quality improvement uh, initiative or evaluation. Next slide. So this is the tool that I talked about, v the VLURA or Venus Leg Ulcer Risk Assessment Tool uh, developed by Christina Parker. It is a validated tool and with permission, it was, um, it was, a, it was adopt, uh, adapted for this evaluation. And um, what you see here is red, yellow, and green. So all of the 11 patients with VLUs were assessed utilizing this tool and those deemed at moderate risk of non-healing within 24 weeks, which is the yellow bubble that you're seeing or the yellow circle, um, as well as those determined high risk of non-healing within 24 weeks, which is the red circle, were placed on gecko. And those that were not um, considered a high risk, uh, which is the green bubble, were not started on gecko on the initial assessment. So the methods for this quality improvement initiative or this case series was uh, patients were seen within our community clinics and they were assessed by a, a wound care advisor or wound care specialist uh, for us also known as an NSWOG. If the 11 patients met the inclusion criteria, criteria and that inclusion criteria was um, if they had developed a new venous leg ulcer or a recurrent venous leg ulcer, they were included in this evaluation. And then of course, as I mentioned, they were all assessed using the venous leg ulcer risk assessment tool. And those that scored at low risk, because the tool offers a baseline assessment and then a two week reassessment 
those that initially started off as low risk or the green bubble were also reassessed in two weeks. Um, and if there was a change from low to moderate, they were uh, provided with Gecko device at that time. Next slide. So here is our, one of the first of a few graphs that we'll be reviewing. So this slide talks a lot about the results that were seen pre-application of Gecko device for all of the 11 uh, patients that were included in this um, evaluation. So you'll notice that pre-Gecko, we weren't seeing any um, we weren't seeing any healing or closure. Um, and then post gecko application, you'll see that 72% of those that were within this evaluation were taken to closure and 27.3 were not. Next slide. So this slide shows you results pre and post uh, the use of gecko and the daily healing rates percentage per day. So pre-Gecko, you'll actually see that we weren't seeing any closure at all. In fact, there were some wounds that were actually getting worse. And then post-Gecko, you'll see that we saw a 1.5% per day healing rate with the application of Gecko um, for these patients. Next slide. So this slide was uh, one that was really interesting for us um, and really just summarizes what we ultimately saw when we were using the, the tool um, on baseline. So when we were using the venous leg ulcer risk assessment tool, 27% of those in the study were deemed a moderate risk for non-healing within 24 weeks. And 73% uh, were seen, or eight of those 11 patients, were seen at low risk and were expected to heal without any issues. Uh, at reassessment in two weeks, um, where we were reassessed everybody, you'll notice that now all of the 11 patients at this point were at moderate risk for non-healing. So potentially what this slide uh, ultimately says is that, you know, if GECA were applied earlier, um, as an early intervention, you're potentially, um, potentially you could see improved healing. So next slide. Uh, so ultimately our findings um, indicated that with the use of a validated risk assessment tool like the venous leg ulcer risk assessment, it really did help guide whether or not a wound was at risk of non-healing within four, uh, 24 weeks. So this for us was something that we saw really bridged the gap between whether or not a clinician considered using gecko therapy um, or not, and when they were going to consider using it within their practice. Um, a lot of the delays that we saw up within our chart reviews included delays um, because uh, many of the clinicians were waiting for vascular studies, which now we know with recent um, research that this is now no longer necessary for application of gecko. Uh, we also saw that 73% of those wounds, as you saw in the previous graph, closed within 12 weeks. So Mississauga Halton, our average healing rate for venous leg ulcers is roughly around 15 to 18 weeks. So we saw significant um, significant decrease in, um, in healing rates or close, closure rates with the application of GECO. So ultimately early intervention using this device improves healing outcomes. For us, we saw reduced nursing visits and wound care product costs. Next slide. So as I mentioned on the onset, at the onset of, of this talk, um, a parallel qualitative study was also conducted alongside this one. And it was done um, by Dr. Janet Kunke. And this qualitative um, study in, involved interviews of seven of the participants. And what, they fo what she focused on was um, exploring the individual's perspective on using the gecko device at, while living with a new or recurring venous leg ulcer. So participants, did they, what they discussed uh, was the use of pain meds, the stress associated with living with a leg ulcer. They talked about the negative impact they, it had on themselves, the family, 
how it decreased their functional status and really intensified the dependency that they had on others. Um, however, when they started to use Gecko, they identified hope and optimism. They could see uh, that wounds were closing. It ultimately assisted in eliminating some of the pain medications that they were on. And a lot of them had the ability to wear um, pants, socks, shoes in a much more comfortable way. Next slide. So this is one quote that Peter um, shared during uh, his interviews. I took these pain meds and narcotic meds all the time before using the gecko device. Then during the time the gecko was on my leg, I was not taking those meds. I was getting healed by the device working. And now after I stopped the device, I am great. I am feeling good. So there's a lot of hope and optimism. And this one was a really impactful quote that we really wanted to share. Implications of practice. So what we saw was that delays in access to timely and appropriate care can negatively impact wound healing. Initiation of gecko device was delayed a lot of the times because of clinicians waiting for vascular studies, um, but now they no longer need to wait for this and an ABPI uh, is not required prior to the initiation of the gecko device. We also saw that using a very simple validated risk assessment tool did influence the use of gecko sooner um, for patients because it did really help identify those wounds that were at risk of non-healing at 24 weeks. We also saw that, it, that gecko, when used sooner, improved healing and decreased nursing visits. So for Mississauga Halton, as part of some of the opportunities of change within our, our policies and procedures, as we are now um, including the venous leg ulcer risk assessment tool as part of the lower leg assessment for our wound care advisors and our NSWACs to utilize um, as part of their assessment. And we are modifying our policies and procedures um, to ensure early access of effect effective therapy like GECO. Next slide. And I think uh, I will pass this one over to Kathy. So the take home message um, is that ex you've examined the etiology and pathophysiology of edema on wound healing, identified the impediments to wound healing that lead to chronic wounds, recognize the impact of early intervention on wound healing using a validated risk assessment tool, and assess the role of the gecko device as first line adjunctive therapy in the treatment and management of wounds and that ABPI is not required for initiation of the GECO device. Okay, Kathy, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. No, that's fine. I was just gonna say we'll be open to questions. Okay, and we have some questions that we received ahead of time, and there are a number in the chat. I was assigned the first one, I think, because nobody else wanted to answer it, but um, what's the difference between velocity and flux? And velocity is really the speed or the distance over time uh, that the blood is flowing, if you like, in this case, through the arteries. Flux is interesting, but it represents um, the percentage of increased perfusion at the capillary level or at the wound base level. And um, there is a difference in oxygen turnover that can actually be measured even uh, before you see the visible uh, pulse and you see the contraction of the calf muscle. And this can go up, uh, up to almost 225% of what was the original flux. So flux is something that can be measured by a laser and uh, you can see a, a photograph of perfusion, which probably represents increased oxygen transfer. Now, I think that uh, there are some more questions and although it's used for chronic venous stasis and Kathy, I'm going to expand this. Uh, when a venous ulcer heals, can we still use the gecko? And, 
in our questions during the session, could we use it for lymphedema without an ulcer? So I think those two kind of clump together a little bit. Okay, so the first question related to once the wound is closed, um, should we be using gecko? Um, we know that, the, that a patient who has a wound, uh, when they're closed, they only get to about 20% tensile strength of normal skin. So it may make some sense to continue uh, with gecko for another couple of weeks just to build up some of that tensile strength. From an economical perspective, um, I would say that I would not recommend keeping them on it for any length of time. As for uh, the question with lymphedema, we do see results in the reduction of lymphedema. And there's some studies that can show that there's uh, it will impact the uh, fibrolytic effect so that uh, there's less fibrin in the tissues. Um, I think the root cause of lymphedema uh, has to be explored um, before you would uh, sort of look at, at gecko long-term. I think for chronic lymphedema, uh, really they need more lymph massage, compression therapy, uh, in my opinion. Okay, and I think that's right. Uh, Rochelle, how can they get um, uh, a gecko in uh, Mississauga? Does it go beyond your venous um, ulcers and your diabetic foot ulcers? Um, so currently right now, uh, gecko is approved for use for uh, venous leg ulcers and for diabetic foot ulcers. Um, our protocol right now is that these wounds are followed by a wound care advisor or an NSWAC or um, we also do request that the involvement of the, of the physician or most responsible physician be aware that, that gecko is going to be tried. Um, we also do recommend that as part of um, providing this device that compression be used alongside for venous leg ulcers um, or if it's for a diabetic foot ulcer that the uh, foot is offloaded um, in some way as well. Um, one of the other criteria we do also look for is that there is intact skin just uh, with no dermatitis just so that um, the gecko won't have any issues sticking to the leg. Um, currently it is available in a variety of different home and community care regions so um, you know I think there's about seven of them that are offering gecko and many may have very similar um, uh, similar policies or processes to accessing um, gecko at this point there there is a, there needs to be an active wound in place um, okay and um, I think and so just expanding this a little bit uh, Kathy is the product good for long-term care residents and I know uh, that it is available in BC it is available through Rivera, but um, uh, what type of specific indications might it have in long-term care? Oh, it has a huge impact uh, in long-term care. Um, in fact, Rivera, uh, they did, there was an evaluation done in uh, 2016 uh, with the Rivera facilities, and they looked at 11 residents with 14 wounds, and they were venous leg ulcer, they were mixed disease, they were diabetic foot, pressure injury, trauma, and surgical wounds. And uh, seven of the 11 uh, residents, uh, they ended up uh, having dramatic uh, improvement uh, with gecko to the wound surface area. Um, in fact, the, in Ontario with Rivera, um, the gecko device was awarded the Ontario Long-Term Care Association Quality and Innovation Award. And Rivera has uh, invested uh, into uh, gecko therapy. Okay, Robin, this is for you. Uh, can you explain the difference in the mechanism of action of gecko device and e-stimulation? Okay, uh, well, yes, I think sometimes these are confused, but they're quite different in terms of uh, 
uh, technology. They are both advanced or adjuvant therapies, but the ESTEM involves delivery of electric current really directly into the wound base or around the wound. Um, it requires a, um, a regulated health professional to do this, and it's quite time consuming um, in terms of, you know, the two seconds it takes to put on uh, a gecko. Um, so there's really uh, quite a bit of difference. I think availability of the, the product is also quite a bit different. Um, it's, it's easy to get your hands on a gecko and, and ESTEM can be a little bit more difficult to uh, get in the community. Um, oh. They're not really competing technologies are quite a bit different. I, I don't think that e, e stimulation is really having any effect on any kind of muscular action. It's more an electrical stimulation. Yeah, and I think it, it can be used with compression and it is important that it's an adjunctive therapy and the mainstay of treating a venous ulcer is compression. And usually we talk about bandages for healing and then stockings uh, for support or preventing recurrences. Now, Catherine Burt and Sharon Gavison have asked the most difficult questions of the night. And I'll leave it open to all the panel and we may even need some help from our sponsor. If Starling's Law has been revised to say that no filtration is present, why would varicose veins and chronic venous insufficiency cause swelling? Does fluid leak out of the venule? Um, and I think just to start that, but to get some collaboration, uh, there is backflow of fluid and backflow of fluid then um, really um, creates capillary engorgement and capillary um, fragility so that uh, the tension in the capillary is greater than in the tissue. Uh, so there is an outflow to the tissues. But does anybody want to add to that? Robin, do you have, uh, yeah, this I, goes back to your topic. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I read all these papers extensively and the math around all of this is, is quite confusing. I wouldn't recommend it, but um, really, <laughs> No, it, I mean, the first two pages are good, but after that, you want to you wanna duck out. But really what they're saying with this is that the venous system is still working and the Starian's Law is still there and still applies. It's just not the only thing. It has to do with the glycocalyx on the vessel wall that makes it so that the diffusion is not so straightforward and a fluid does stay in the interstitial fluid and that's where the lymphatic system mops up the rest. So the quantities might be variable, but the calculation math mathematical model states that the lymphatic system is really doing a, a large portion of the uh, return upwards, but it is both systems. So when you do have a damage to the venous system, you've got all that fluid in the interstitial space, which causes an inflammatory reaction, which will also damage the lymphatic system. So again, it's, it's, it's everything seems to be what we're dealing with is a vicious cycle. Yeah, and there may be a fibrin cuff and other things uh, yeah, playing a role. Yeah, the cuff, yeah, the model of the fibrin cuff, if you, you know, if you believe that one is, is possible there too. But I think it's really the inflammatory process that's going on in the interstitial space as a result of the congestion and the inflammatory mediators that get left there that cause the problem. And you see that with the lipodematosclerosis and woody fibrosis. Now, Sharon uh, Gavison, can you please describe the waveform of the stimulation? Is it monophasic or biphasic? And what is the maximum amplitude of uh, stimulation? Is there a risk of skin irritation at the point of application? I'll say it's not very common to get skin irritation and that there are three sites uh, that you can potentially look at uh, below the knee, above the knee, and in the knee crease at the back that could influence uh, mobility. Kathy, is that something that you can answer or do you want to shunt that? Sure. No, no, Dr. Sibold, I can answer that. Um, and that's one of the things that we're so pleased with, with the no W3, um, is that it, with the three electrodes, it's certainly more comfortable and uh, there's less, um, the patient doesn't feel uh, as much of the, uh, the electrical stimulation, but also the fact that uh, we now, it's now a hydrocolloid backing. And if there is an issue uh, with irritation, just like you said, I, I just have gone through a patient who was using the new uh, W3 and they broke down with a rash and it didn't have to be treated with any intervention other than using alternative placement, as you said, 
above the knee or just below? Mm -hmm. And the, the other question, I'm sorry, Liz. Um, yeah, no, that's fine. And have gecko users experienced any effects on neuropathy? And, you know, and I guess it would be, you know, allodynia or increased, like with neuropathy, you can sometimes have increased sensitivity of the skin. And maybe the neuropathy has to be treated systemically to tolerate the device if that's there. But... Robin, have you got anything to add on that or Kathy? On neuropathy? Yeah. No, well, that would be great. I, I would certainly be interested in any study that looked at anything that would help neuropathy, as I'm sure all of our attendees would too, because it's a big struggle. There's been not a lot of research or good, good studies to improve neuropathy in patients other than the couple of medications that we currently have. So yeah, I think, I think I'd love to use it on neuropathy. And some patients, anecdotally, they will say that they uh, they have less pain and they can start to feel sensation in the foot or the limb. Um, and some of the work that was done with Dr. Keith Harding certainly uh, looked at uh, pain reduction uh, with the gecko. Okay, uh, what about the cost of the gecko, Kathy? You're probably closest to this. Yeah, I certainly can speak to that, Dr. Sybil. Um, once again, with the new W3, um, it comes in a pack of seven devices, which is for a two week period. And the cost is the same as it always has been. It's, so for two weeks, it would be $750, um, but they're getting double the therapy now and they're getting uh, seven days of therapy instead of six. So they're getting double the, their bang for their buck. Okay, that's good. Now there is a question on um, whether or not we can get a copy of the Venus Leg Ulcer Assessment Tool. And I know the abstract is freely available, but I think the paper, you're going to need a university or other source to be able to get the paper. And I'm not sure, Rochelle, if you've got any hints on how people get that paper or get a hold of that tool in a legal way. Um, so right now it's actually available online. So if you just Google Christina Parker v VLU Do risk that. assessment tool, you'll be able to actually see a link that go takes you directly to the tool. Um, yeah. Okay. I guess what we found out here was you can see it, but you can't download it. Yes, you can't. You can only see it. Um, so if the question is specific to um, what we're using in Mississauga Halton, we can, you know, I can connect with, uh, I think Charlene is actually somebody that I, I know, so I can connect with, with you, Charlene. Okay, that's great. Um, and what would, uh, Kathy, the total cost of the gecko for 12 weeks of healing for the 73% of uh, venous ulcers that were not healing? The cost? Yeah, and I guess you really, the more important figure is cost effectiveness. You know, really looking at um, what the cost is of the gecko and what the cost is of continually serving those clients uh, for non-healing ulcers. Well, I think first of all, the cost saving is in the human resource side because the nurses don't have to, uh, to go in to, apply it, the patient can either apply it or their caregiver can be taught to, uh, to put it on. Um, and we do it virtually uh, now that we're in COVID uh, and lockdowns. Um, the last three patients that, uh, that I've had on, on Gecko, um, they simply just uh, looked at the video and uh, it was quite easy for them to put it on. Um, from a cost analysis perspective, um, patients with these really chronic wounds, um, you know, I can give you two examples. There was one, one patient who was 32 years with the same, same wound and they put him on gecko and in 16 weeks uh, he closed. And I currently have somebody who's actively uh, using gecko and they were 17 months with their wound and we're now eight weeks into therapy and they're like 95% closed. So I guess just even the cost of the dressings and the nursing visits over that 
32 years or 17 months, um, if you can get them healed in eight to 12 weeks, uh, certainly um, is a cost saving. Okay, now when we talk about the gecko healing other types of leg ulcers, uh, there's not a lot of data, but if you had a venous component and edema, it may help you, but you really need the cause of that ulcer and consider a biopsy. Will the gecko device help with lymphedema and pressure injury altogether? Uh, that's speculative and needs more study. Appreciate the interesting uh, presentations. RCD, did you consider some factors such as wound size and ischemia? That'll be in RCTs that are currently planned. Can gecko be used in clients at home after surgery when they can't walk? You have to look at form versus function and the reasons first. If muscle pump exercises were performed for the same duration instead of gecko application, would you get the same results? I think that study needs to be done, but Kathy or anybody else, if you know of it, tell me. How do you access Gecko for patients and clients and how much? Contact the company. How can you get samples? Contact the company. I have a client with Henning Scholl and Purpura. Would a Gecko be helpful? They may still have the phase of increased uh, capillary permeability and damage, so that's probably not your best client. So sad the Toronto Central then does not approve the gecko. Uh, can you send them the findings? For the patients with healed arterial wounds now have a foot at risk, gecko an option? Maybe if you've got enough blood supply to heal, but you've got to look at if you can correct the arterial wound. In patients with lymphedema moving fluid from the lower legs, I think you have to be careful with that. You uh, may need to use a lymphopress and then appropriate compression. Are there any cases um, in which gecko is not recommended? There are um, exclusions that you can look at in the product monograph. We've talked about cost. Will the stimulation be affected if we're using any creams on the skin? It might. If um, Kathy, why don't you comment on that? That's a good one. If with creams, yeah, it's not recommended uh, to have any creams. They, the skin needs to be cleansed and dried well, uh, yeah. and uh, because it it won't be effective uh, if there's uh, contact with the cream. And just as I think of it, Doctor Sybil, with the cost savings, and Rochelle, you can speak to this because it's came out of your evaluation. It was roughly 2,300 per patient that you saved. Okay, and I think Carol Lotz, the cost will vary depending on how yeah. many devices you use and for how long and um, what the other parameters are. And we're probably looking at cost savings. We are over time. I'd like to thank um, our sponsors. I'd like to thank uh, the three panelists. And um, I think Kathy, Rochelle, and Robin, you did a great job. And uh, thank you, all of our listeners and participants. And um, uh, have a good night, everybody. And stay safe. Uh, be kind. And bye for now. Good night, all. Good night, everyone. Hi. Thank you. Good night. Good night, thank all. You, everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Doris, for keeping us and Jeff in line as much as that's humanly possible. <laughs> Bye for now.